Okay, everybody, welcome back to another Summer of Drawing. And today we're going to do toned paper again. And this time we're going to be uh, doing a, a tool, a vintage wood plane as the subject matter. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. We've got tons to cover, lots of drawing to do today. And we're going to be concentrating on how to work blending, using blending stumps or a Q-tip or a rag or whatever you have, how to work that into your drawing process. So let me go ahead and share the screen. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another summer of drawing. This is class number six, and today the theme is uh, home, and we're going to be drawing a wood plane. You might wonder about how that fits into uh, the theme of home, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, and show you. Um, so I live with a shipwright, somebody who builds boats. In fact, this is one of his wooden boats down here on the right. I couldn't help but brag. This got launched uh, about a week and a half ago. And I just think it's lovely. But when you're living with someone who has tools around or does any sort of uh, craft, uh, it could be uh, woodworking, could be uh, building something, could be sewing or whatever, th there are usually a lot of uh, implements. And some of those can be really interesting to draw and make really good um, drawing subject. So when I was thinking about home, to me, th there's a lot of uh, <coughs> sawdust. <laughs> there are a lot of tools uh, around the home. Um, it's just been part of my life for for decades now. So I found this really wonderful image on the upper left that we're going to use as our main reference today as we work through tone paper and, and working in blending. But I also wanted to show you uh, another uh, picture. And this is a what I call a more realistic one. So the one on top is a stock image. Some photographer has very carefully set up a scene and carefully draped <laughs> these lovely uh, curly cues of, of uh, shavings uh, in a very artistic manner, but that's absolutely not what happens <laughs> in the actual boat shop. The actual boat shop looks more like this picture below. And so what I decided to do as I started on this drawing myself was I decided to, to eliminate some of those rolls of, of curls of shaving. Um, and so as we go forward, you'll see I only left one in there because I thought it was a bit more realistic. However, if you want to draw this again at some point in the future and you want to include all of that stuff, obviously it's great. So uh, let's just move on and talk about um, a kind of a refresher on working on tone paper. Tone paper allows us to use um, the paper as the local color. So that means that instead of having to draw something that represents, you know, in color, the wood, the shavings, the table, that sort of thing. We're just going to be worrying about the dark areas of the of the uh, drawing and the light ones. But at the same time, we've got a lot of dark here. And so we're going to have to figure out what to do with all of that. Are we going to draw it all or not? So the um, the basic steps that we go through for tone paper, no matter what, blending or not blending, uh, we draw in the, the overall scene very lightly. Uh, just a few lines to kind of show where everything goes. Now, I do this for almost every type of drawing. There, there is very little drawing that I do that I just start off drawing in one corner and kind of move over without sort of mapping out a plan. But I do it very lightly, uh, just a light touch, because those lines will get erased almost for certain during the process. So then I squint, or <laughs> if you don't want to get wrinkles, look very carefully through your eyelashes, what you're trying to do is eliminate the, the uh, distracting information, which is color and all of that sort of thing. And just look for the dark and light patterns. Where are the darks in the, in, where, where are the darkest areas, the shadows in the, in the image? And then where are the lightest areas? Because everything in between is going to be taken care of by the toned paper. So as you draw, first you draw on your darks. Some blending might be useful at this step, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, then adding in the highlights and the lights, and then you refine and restate the darks and lights as needed, and that's it, because the, the toned paper itself has done so much work for you. So I just wanted to show you kind of the progress that I made and about the time that I'm giving you to draw. Uh, there's the reference material. I did a really rough sketch and no tan combined, which, which we'll do today. And then after I worked through the various steps, I got to this image on the right. Um, and of course, we'll be going through step by step so you can see sort of how that's done. I thought it turned out um, to be a good plan if I wanted to do uh, a larger image like this. So let's talk for uh, just a minute about the tools for blending. Um, blending stumps are these uh, the vertical 
um, kind of rolled paper, rolled very soft paper over on the right hand side. And then something called uh, tortillon, which just means rolled paper in French <laughs> or, or, or rolled up, I think, or something like that in French. Uh, and you will also find them sold as tortillions. You'll hear both words. And these are just paper uh, rolled up, kind of compressed that you can use um, as, a, as a blending tool. And I usually have different ones for uh, blending in graphite versus blending the white charcoal versus blending, say, the red Conte crayon, because they will start to, you know, they're still, they'll muddy each other up. So I have separate ones, but I don't really use all the different sizes. I really use like a, one large and one medium, but you don't even have to have these blending stumps in order to blend. You can use a soft rag, like a, like a old piece of a flannel shirt or something like that, or a t-shirt. Um, cotton swabs, a lot of people prefer cotton swabs. Uh, and some people also use, their fingers. And so when I'm out sketching, for example, travel sketching or something like that, I just use my finger to blend. But if I was doing a finished drawing, I probably, you know, something larger, I probably wouldn't do that because sometimes oils from our skin can actually over time affect the paper. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. Now, when you do any blending, you can, you can just sort of blend it within the drawing and then erase the parts that almost always inevitably um, go too far. You know, you smudge a little bit too much. But there are also things like drawing shields or people uh, cut their own pieces of paper for certain parts of their drawing to act kind of as a shield so that when they're doing the blending, they don't get, uh, you know, the smudging into parts they don't want to. However, I rely a lot on the eraser. I am very keen on not using the blending stump overly. There are, there are and I, I don't want to, um, denigrate anybody who, who uses a blending stump a lot in their drawing. But there's a tendency, I feel, to over rely on the blending stump rather than controlling the values using the pencil the way that, uh, that we have done for the last five classes, where you either vary the pressure, you use different types of, uh, you bevel your lead in different ways to achieve different kinds of effects. Um, you do sort of the academic drawing where you hold it uh, further back and you're very uh, careful about how much pressure you're applying. Um, these ways, I feel, add more texture and interest to a drawing. So I use blending stumps as a sort of a shortcut to get me through some of those stages and on into the drawing. So the first thing I'd like you to do, just to sort of play around with blending before we start the actual drawing, I've got here three kind of stages I'd like you to go through. And you can do, you can you can draw anything you want to on just some scrap of paper. So what I did was I just did, you know, uh, uh, in this particular case, I used, I picked up one of my beveled end pencils and I did some strokes and I did some strokes closer together and then some really short little dash strokes and then some that were spaced further apart. Then what I did was I took my, uh, my drawing stump and I, my blending stump and I blended, uh, this graphite. So I used a 4B or a 6B, I think, pencil for this particular exercise. So I blended and I got this kind of uh, interesting, maybe what I would say was like a 20% value um, kind of behind the, the drawing uh, that I had done. But in a way, it also toned everything down. It made it a little bit less punchy. And so then I came in, and this is what I'd like you to do also um, during the course of this, is uh, come back in on top of that after you've done your blending and add a little bit more graphite to the top. So what I did was I think I used a um, probably a, an HB pencil and it was one that was relatively sharp. And then I came in on top of, uh, of two of the, the upper left and the lower right um, blended areas and just sort of added tonality first on one side and then on the other side to sort of create an illusion of a little bit of an illusion of form there. Um, and then just, just did the same sort of thing with the other bit, the textured bit and the one where I had, I had colored um, all over. I just added some uh, darker strokes on top of the blended stuff. And this I thought gave a really interesting effect. If you look at the bottom four examples versus the top four examples, you know, all of a sudden you've got a little bit more oomph going on, but you didn't lose it all completely. If you stop at that second level, those the four that are in the middle, 
they're not that interesting. They're kind of blah. Everything sort of became, had a, has a sameness to it. So I, I strongly feel that good drawing, um, and this is good in, in my opinion, <laughs> not your opinion necessarily, um, either depends very heavily on, on your pencil stroke, using the values of the pencils, using different nibs, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, sorry, not nibs, uh, uh, ends, of, ends of the pencils, like a beveled lead or, or whatever, um, to get different effects, or incorporates blending, but not as the final step, sort of a sandwich layer uh, in between the bread of the graphite. So just to go ahead and uh, work on that for a couple of minutes. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about, um, about blending in general. So you can use blending in various different parts of your drawing, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Today, we've got this very large dark area at the back behind the wood plane. It's going to be perfect for, for getting that all sort of sorted out. Um, early on in the drawing. Likewise, I find it really useful if you've got dark areas kind of bleeding into other dark areas across your drawing, you can use this blending technique to sort of unify things as you get started to give it, you know, kind of that no tan feel that I'm always talking about where you've got a good design of your darks. The blending stump helps you sort of sort that out early on. Um, it, it, does create an even tone, it can also remove the texture and character of that area. So I definitely think either a preliminary or middle layer is the best uh, place to use it. Um, and then really make sure that you're still using hard and soft pencil leads, pressure, uh, lead shape, drawing style, you know, whether it's sketchy or academic or whatever, to give your drawing a liveliness. All right, let's move on. Okay. Quickly, let's observe uh, what's going, going on in this scene and what we need. So what I decided to do was just draw the plane and the first kind of clumping of shavings that are down on the right-hand side, not the ones to the far right and not the ones that are draped artistically over the top. So a couple of things to note is that uh, you can always edit, take in, move out, you know, whatever you want to do with any scene. Just because I'm suggesting to draw a particular way doesn't mean you have to do it. Uh, and I do, however, want you to note the light direction, because if you do move things around or take things out, um, you still want the light to be logical and everything to work as if it would really uh, work that way in real life, no matter where you've placed objects. The other thing I wanted to point out is if you take something away, like those draped uh, curly cues of, of, the, of the shavings, obviously there's going to be stuff under there that we have no idea what it is, what it looks like. We don't know anything about it. Now, if you've been around uh, wood planes and seen things like that, you might imagine that there was probably some kind of either a bolt or fastener or, or some way to hold that uh, the the blade of the plane in place between those, those two pieces of wood. But you don't have to know that, and you can completely draw it without it, because to a certain extent, there's an implied symmetry of object forms. Um, not everything is symmetrical. Uh, if we looked at the handle part, um, it's, it is curved and divided that in half. That is, of course, not symmetrical. But if we put that, if we move the plane so that it was straight on, and, and we had that handle part towards us, it is very likely that from side to side, that plane handle has symmetry. And so we can use that information to, to assume that what we can't see underneath that plane probably looks a lot like the flip side of what we can see. And we can just sort of proceed with that uh, under that assumption, because to a certain extent, it doesn't matter, right? Once again, we're not doing a forensic examination of the wood plane, we're, but we are trying to draw something that looks logical. The same goes for these, these uh, curly cues. We don't have to draw every single curly cue exactly the way we see it here, because there is a logical progression of movement that we understand as humans. We know that as things curve, they keep curving around until they get to the end. Um, we could make only three curls or five curls. We don't have to do 10 curls or however many it is. And it will still kind of give the same idea. That's when I often look at other reference, like that rather messy picture I showed you up front um, of, of a real life uh, workbench and, and go, OK, you know, what, what other types of shavings could I possibly include? Would there be something else that could be done? 
All right, and here's a little discussion before we start on how to handle a very dark background. So let me just go back here for a second. It would be possible, but maybe a little crazy to try to put all of that dark in really evenly behind. It works wonderfully in a photo, but is it necessary? Probably not. So here's how, for example, John Singer Sargent used to handle um, you know, adding some dark to the background, depending on what the situation was. Um, there's also an unknown artist down here from the mid 1800s who drew this particular ruin. And because the light was shining on the ruin, included some darks behind just to sort of, you know, highlight that contrast. That's the same thing that we'll be dealing with today. In the upper left hand corner, only enough dark just to sort of show that there was some sky, once again, to kind of punch out the lighter part of the buildings. And then on these two people, although a, a lot of John Singer Sargent's charcoals use a dark background, um, he would vary how he would uh, place that darkness, basically because he wanted to use it as a way, as a foil for the light part of the face. And that kind of created the skin tone versus the background, rather than having to have a lot of outlines. So that's sort of the way that we're going to look at this today. Um, the very first thing I'd like um, for you to do is to spend about, oh, about five or six minutes just doing a very small sketch um, of what your plan today is going to be. So what I've done here on this screen is I've, I've mashed both the thumbnail and the no tan stage together, kind of like we did when we did the rocking chair, but I'm not breaking this out into, into two different slides. We're just going to stay on this one picture. And I wanted to do that because if you decided you wanted to add some extra shavings in or do something like that, I wanted to be able to show you this other reference material. So I really like, especially when working on tone paper, and particularly if I'm using reference or a combination of reference and live objects or uh, multiple bits of reference or adding something in from my imagination, I like to do a little rough sketch. It can be on toned paper, since we're working on toned paper, kind of helps you um, have a plan. And then if, I, if I'm either short on time or just feel it's more expedient, I kind of build my no tan idea into that sketch rather than making a separate little uh, no tan by itself. And that's what I've done today so that we can spend most of the time going through the drawing stages rather than breaking it out into two separate steps. So the thumbnail is really just working out your um, composition and noting potential problems. So the first thing I noticed when I finished my thumbnail was that I had that, that round washer um, and, and the little indentation on the side was starting to look a lot like an eye. <laughs> and I was starting to have an anthropomorphic wood plane going on here. And I mean, that's fine and everything. Once I started seeing that, I couldn't unsee it. So I decided when I got to the actual drawing part, I needed to minimize that. Even though in the reference material, it's quite prominent, I decided for my drawing, it would be better not to have that included. I also decided that, you know, I, I might as well figure out how these darks are going to work in the background. Um, how much is enough? How much is too much? And so for this, I used one of my uh, bevel ended uh, pencils to very, very quickly. That's one of the things I love about having some pencils with a bevel end to the lead. Very quickly uh, used a 4B and sort of added in the background, came back in with my mechanical pencil just to make it a little bit neater to see, okay, how much, how much do we actually have to have back here to, to kind of have the darks? And then what was I going to do with that table up front? I wasn't quite sure. So I threw in some hatching and a little bit of highlighting just to sort of see what would happen. And then I added a few more shavings because I was eliminating the curly cues, I thought, well, maybe I could add a few more shavings in. Now, in my drawing as I went along, um, I actually forgot about that. <laughs> and they didn't end up going into the actual drawing itself. But this is the sort of thing to consider uh, up front. You know, what is the plan? How am I going to go into this drawing? You know, in the in the Beginning in the introductory uh, you know, video that I did before starting another summer of drawing, I talked about doing a lot of starts. And for me, the thumbnails and no tan are absolutely part of the start. Um, it really helps you make a great number of decisions about what you're going to do. It's very difficult 
if you've put 4B pencil down all over your paper, especially if it's a soft paper, to, to erase back out of that and, and get something that you know, has a satisfying look. And that's such a dominant feature. The, this dark background is such a dominant feature. So for things like backgrounds like this, and there may be other subject matter that you either, you know that you want to do a drawing that's coming up or you have some questions about it. It's really worth starting to accumulate. If you're, if you're online doing it, maybe just have a folder full of images that you save of uh, maybe famous artists work and how they kind of handled certain things. Or if you see over time, you know, whether you're on Instagram or Facebook or whatever other artists work where they have solved a problem that you're having. And you can always make a note of what they did, how, how they went about it. So when you hit that problem, you can do the same sort of thing. This is why I turned to the uh, John Singer Sargent images. I knew that this was something that he took on frequently when he was doing his charcoal heads and that we could probably get some clues from that. All right, let's go ahead and, and get started on, uh, on the, the first part of the actual drawing. So it, just like before, I'm gonna show you one slide that has my artwork large, so you can see what I did. And then the, the next slide will have the reference large and my artwork small so that you can uh, work on. And what I'm going to try to do is give you a, a quite a reasonable amount of time, <laughs> comparatively speaking, on all of these steps today. So we'll have it five minutes, maybe seven minutes on this very first step, which is just figuring out where everything is based on your your thumbnail, um, how you decided to start. It, it'll take a little while for you to position um, your objects kind of uh, within, if you're doing a rectangle, I tend to start off that way just to sort of give me a framework to work in. Um, and, you know, get your angles right, have a look and see how you're doing. You'll notice that I'm using a lot of just straight lines rather than curved lines, even though some of these objects have a lot of curve to them, because I find I can always round out those surfaces later, but just for a placement point of view, make sure my angles are going in basically the right direction. Uh, you can just get started like this. So here's the larger reference for you to look at. Um, and so I'll, I'll just chat along while you guys are, are drawing. A couple of things I decided uh, not to do. One of them was I decided not to worry overly about the exact proportions of this plane. I just wanted to get in there and, and sort of start drawing and see what happened, you know, what, what was I going to notice once I started into, uh, into this drawing? And one of the first things I noticed is that that handle shape is quite a challenge to draw. Um, and to a certain extent, does it matter if you get it exactly right? And, and through the course of the drawing, I changed mine a couple of times to make it a little bit more accurate because I felt it really did need to look as if you could hold it with one hand while you were pushing the plane with the other. I, I felt like that, that was necessary. But these are the sorts of things when it comes to drawing that um, I've actually got some notes I made that I'm going <laughs> to, to talk to you about today. Um, so you might wonder why I don't spend a lot of time getting you to draw things exactly, you know, ex exact measurements for, you know, of how long is this plane, exact measurements of the height or that sort of thing. And it's because I really don't want you in the mode of, of being a copier. Um, there are times it is really useful to copy something exactly. Uh, and a lot of the academic drawing kind of exercise of going through copying casts and models and this, that, and the other with exactitude, there's a lot of benefit to that because it does train your eye to look at something very precisely and get your measurements right. It does help overall. But I really think that when it comes to actually, you know, doing a drawing, I'd rather that you were able to assess the scene for a composition overall, rather than having to worry about uh, whether every detail in the scene was, was correct. When we look at some of the drawings that we really are amazed by, that we see that the artists who we consider famous have done, many of them are incomplete, sketchy, uh, out of proportion, um, at odd angles, <laughs> and yet there's some charm to them. There's something amazing about them that, that we enjoy. Um, very few of them are amazing to us because of their 
detail and exactness. Now, I think detail and exactness are an important part of the learning process. You know, once you know you can do that, then you can shorthand, you can, you can get to the other stuff. But to start with, I think it's extremely important to, um, to not feel that a drawing is only good if it's a precise representation of what you're looking at. So um, it, it's more important to me that you find a way to lay out a little scene on your paper that satisfies you, um, whether or not when you hold it up right next to the, the picture, it looks exactly that way or not. Um, one of the things that I think is important to think about with that is if, you know, your work is never going to look exactly like the thing that you are drawing. Because if it did, if it looked exactly like it, it would be the thing. <laughs> it would be that object. It would have three dimension, it would exist in space. You know, what we're doing is we're creating an illusion of whatever that thing is. Uh, an illusion that some other human being would be able to look at and understand, um, or even maybe not understand if we were taking it to an abstract level or, and beyond. Right now we're dealing with a, with a representational approach to art, but I don't want that to become like a ball and chain. Um, you know, to me, representational means recognizable. <laughs> Whereas to some artists, representational means it's got to look just like that thing that you see right there. And I think that that's really um, I, uh, suffocating for artists to have that um, point of view. When we look at beautiful impressionist paintings or whatever, and we know that those are water lilies, and we know that that's a particular scene uh, in the fields, uh, in France or whatever, we understand exactly what's going on there just because every every last uh, blade of, of grass was not drawn out. And so the same goes for something like this. We, we see a scene like this, we have a tendency to go, okay, every little uh, nuance of texture and um, all of the wood grain and all of those curly cues have to be represented precisely. But what I prefer you to go for is a drawing that has interesting balance, lights and darks, yeah, sure, we'd like to be able to understand what's going on in there, if that's your intention. Um, and that has some logic to it. But hardly anyone is going to look at your drawing and then look back at this image and, and compare them. Your drawing is going to exist by itself in time. OK, let's move on to the next stage. So the next step is to squint and look for the darkest areas. And I referred back to my little thumbnail as well to, to figure out where I was going to put those darks. Because so many times you get started with the thumbnail, you do the no tan, you have all of that set up, and then it gets put to the side. You forget about it completely. And now you're coloring in the entire background with a big black thing. So this is the perfect time when you're putting in the darks to look back at your thumbnail where you noted where you'd like the darks to be and make sure that they're in sync. So a couple of things you'll notice when as you're drawing uh, and you look at this, I wasn't terribly exact with some of those darks uh, around the curly cues and such. I put them in basically the right place where I saw the stuff. I added in a couple of extra that I just decided I wanted going off the side, but didn't in include the, the whole bevy of curls. Um, and I also kind of did a, some directional shading around the edges. Now, let me move on to where you can see the picture large. And the reason I did that is because I know that I'm going to blend in the next step, after getting these darks down, I'm going to blend. And I wanted some direction and uh, a little bit of life underlying that blending, even though a great deal of it will get obliterated. I wanted to have that energy there. And I'll end up, after blending, put, trying to put some of that back in again to sort of get that feel. Now, it would be perfectly possible not to blend, perhaps to do that directional stroking a little bit more evenly. Um, maybe even to come in with that kind of academic drawing where it's like little hatching or little circular motions to sort of even things out around where the objects are and leave it at that, have those edges be sketchy. That's absolutely not a problem. Um, today, we're just gonna be doing some uh, blending. So I didn't want to, want to do that. Um, the other thing was that I put some darks down in the foreground I wasn't really quite sure where I was going to go with the, the turning edge of this workbench, but I decided some kind of sketchy marks that indicated that this was different, this 
turning edge of the front was different from the background would be useful. So I'll just let you work on that for a few minutes and tell you and uh, share with you a few more of my notes. Really, I think my approach overall and what I'm trying to share with you is that any type of drawing that we're doing in this uh, in this manner, and this goes for abstraction as well, uh, not just not just drawing realistically, we're looking for three main uh, goals. We're, we're after three main goals. The first one is strong design. I really think that if you go into a museum or a gallery, you may not even know what the subject matter of a particular painting or drawing is. But if the design is strong, you're compelled to walk over to, to look at that particular painting or drawing and, and get a closer look, figure out what it's all about. And then you can see the detail. This is why I hammer that whole Notan uh, light and dark contrast and shapes uh, sort of into everyone's head. Not that every drawing or painting has to have high contrast. Some of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen are all in the lights or all in the darks and don't follow that range at all. But you can control those values and work only in the lights or only in super bright colors, very saturated colors, uh, very low chroma colors, all of those things. If you have an understanding of how to make a strong design and for people who are just starting, contrast is a really great jumping off point. And then you can decide, okay, I'm gonna mute down that high contrast in the background. That actually could be as long as it's, it's uniform and still shows off the uh, wood plane, it doesn't have to be that dark. It could be um, you know, a medium gray, a light gray, it could be some other color. So you learn over time how to sort of manipulate that. The second really important point is to be able to draw with convincing form. And convincing form isn't just about drawing the direction of the light, although that's very useful. Convincing form is sort of understanding how an object is formed in, in total, like in, without even having a light source, even if you didn't have a light source there, how would you draw how a particular object is formed? Now, sometimes we have texture to help us. It's kind of like an, an extra thing. Um, we can use the, the lines that go around the curly cues of the, of the shavings to help create uh, texture. We can do a little bit of, of, of shading or, or line work that allows us to, to look at the texture and also the direction of, of which how these shavings are, are curled. But what's most important to me is that without having to draw in every little striation on those curves, that you're able to express how these kinds of forms work by using just enough shading, just enough line or texture, just enough highlight so that we understand what's going on. And this is where toned paper comes in very useful for getting through this particular process. Because as toned paper works as so much of the local color, we can keep the amount of dark that we add into a minimum. We don't have to add every single line that we see on the wood. We don't have to add every single lighter area that's lighter than the black. In the, in the white pencil. That's done by the paper. All we have to work, worry about are the darkest areas and the various, various light areas. Um, so when it comes to lights, darks, perspective, uh, you know, do they work? Are, are we creating a convincing form? And how little can we get away with using? Not how much do we have to put in, but how little can we get away with using to create that convincing form? And then the last part to me that I think is is important that it has that your drawing or painting has to have something to say now it could be the thing it could say is it's a, this is a thing of beauty or this is a thing that attracted my attention or look at these interesting shapes or uh you know whatever the, the story could be something like that it could be a visual story it doesn't have to be an actual uh you know once upon a time type story but I do think that taking the time to whether it's to set up a still life or or find something to look at outdoors, or uh, you know how to position a person that you're drawing so there's a little bit more to it than just a straight on face. Taking that those few extra minutes to try to come up with a little bit of a story 
makes it more interesting to you. If the object is particularly beautiful and even more beautiful with a certain kind of light, then try to get to where that light is. Uh, if, it, if something is kind of somber and interesting in the dark, try to create that feeling of dark. That little extra time to create the story, that's the third key. So strong design, convincing form, and has something to say. And you'll hear me repeat this a lot this summer because I think that this gets you away from worrying that a good drawing is all about exact duplication. Um, I don't think that that is the case at all. And some of the most amazing art that we have in our galleries does not duplicate things exactly in any manner whatsoever. <laughs> and it's still fantastic. OK, let's move on to the next stage. Blending. OK, here we are. So now it's time to blend some of your darks. For example, the background. And then restate the darkest areas with more unblended pencil work. And I'm going to show you both of these stages so you understand what I'm talking about. So first, I took my blending stump. And I was kind of careful about you can get carried away. Once graphite gets on the blending stump, it's all over the place. So I did two things. In the background, where I already, already had a lot of darks, I was pretty careful about not letting it get too you know, too carried away in the, in the background. But then I also used that extra graphite that's on the blending stump to add a little bit of the shading that I knew was going to happen. Because I, although I know that the tone paper is going to carry a lot of this, there are, were a few places where I thought, hmm, I am going to need a little bit of extra shading. Let me just sort of indicate where that's going to be using the graphite. And then I came back in and I used my eraser to clean up where things had gone astray. And I put darks, I put more darks, but did not blend them in the areas where I needed the most contrast or sharpness. So let me just go back to the previous one again. So I started there, and then I just tightened everything up by going to here. So I'll give you a few minutes just to get this part down, because if you haven't done any blending before with blending stumps, or if you're using something um, you know that's kind of large and a little funky, sometimes Q-tips I think are great for um, for blending, but they can they can sometimes you know soften edges too much. You'll want to get in there with that eraser and clean things up. I love erasers for that. I also had done some blending down at the bottom on the table, and then thought, huh, that's a you know that's kind of a lot of blending. <laughs> and so I took my eraser and picked out some you know kind of divots that I thought sort of went along with the workshop um, bench. The other thing that I did, and I'm going to flip back to. Um, to this for a second, I thought I had overdone the, the background dark. And so I went in with my um, eraser, picked out some sort of like some highlights by kind of stumping my kneaded eraser all over the place, and then drew back into those dark areas using a thinner pencil, a mechanical pencil. So let me get this now to a point where you can see your reference more clearly um, and, and just sort of show. But now you can see how pretty quickly um, this stage of adding in the darks, doing some blending, and then restating the darks. Now, when I say restate the darks, I don't mean do the darks all over like you did the first time. What I mean is look for where you want the darkest darks and just add the darks there. And then, yeah, if you have to smooth things out or maybe make some changes like I did, I, I wanted something a little more atmospheric in the background. I think that would be the word to use. I went in and I, uh, I, I uh, used the kneaded rubber just to sort of pick up some of that graphite and went ahead and, um, and used it for a little texture as well. So as I was putting down my, my darks in the background for blending, I did that using the beveled pencil. Um, uh, I used, I think, a 4B. The bevel pencil led. I was able to get my darks down really quickly, just like I did on the thumbnail sketch. When I came back in to add, then I did the blending. And then when I came back in to add the darkest darks, I used a more pointed lead. And I used that drawing method of the academic drawing, where it, it's like tiny little ovals or, or hatching going one way and then hatching going the other way um, to sort of fill in some of the texture on the paper. If I don't know what kind of paper you're working with, but if you're working with the Canson paper, like which is what I tend to use for for this sort of thing. Um, there, there are a lot of divots to fill in. Now, if you're using one of the Strathmore toned paper 
notebooks, you're probably having a lot easier of a time of it. <laughs> because I find that although I like the texture when I'm working large on the Canson paper, this is a small image. This is probably five by seven, my little drawing, because I wanted to make sure I could get it done in the time. Um, and I find working at that size, I very much like the Strathmore, um, their, their uh, wire ring, spiral uh, ringed um, notebooks or sketchbooks. They, I think they come in gray and kind of a brown color and they have a smoother paper. It's an awful lot easier to deal with for stuff like this. There really aren't any drawbacks except uh, sometimes when you get to the point of wanting to um, erase, you sort of have to make sure you haven't gone too you haven't indented the paper um, up front, but that really applies to just about any kind of paper you're using. So somebody has asked about uh, a focal point. What would that focal point be? That is a really great question. Um, I suppose when I was looking at this, I was sort of looking at the entire sort of ensemble uh, going from the, the handle to the where the where the uh, blade is put in, and then down to the the cur the curls that are closest to the um, plane, and then kind of back up to the handle as sort of being the main area of interest for me. But that doesn't mean that you can't decide on something a little bit different. Now, at this point, with the blending in the darks, you really can't tell you know, what I was most interested in. That really sort of comes into play more when I add in the, the highlights. Uh, that kind of gives you a little bit more of the center of interest. But this is a really good point, because if you were going to, for example, if you were going to follow this photograph more exactly uh, and not take out the, the curled um, the curled shavings that are going down across the, the blade area, then that curled uh, area, the, the, the curled shavings that are going down across the blade, the curled shavings that are on the bottom, right close to the plane, and the plane itself, that, um, that would be a really great focal point with the handle, the, the curved handle being sort of a secondary point. How you decide what is of interest is very personal to you. You know, the thing that you think is interesting is probably going to be different from the thing that I think is interesting. And then how to direct the attention to that comes from using contrast and highlights. So say that you did think that the area where the blade was, was more interesting than the handle. That's where you would want to concentrate your darks uh, and your highlights to a greater degree and you would want where the handle is and, and you know the other shavings going off the side to have less contrast and be more muted. Our eyes are always drawn to the areas of more contrast. Let me go ahead and move on to the part that I always think is the most fun, which is putting in those highlights. So what I did, and this is, like I said, this is uh, you know a small image. So um, I just decided I didn't want to get carried away and put too much light all over the place. When I got to this particular um, uh, area, I was wondering myself, you know, do I put the, where do I put the lights? How am I going to decide this? And I decided my first, my first course of action, because I really hadn't decided, was to go for where I saw the lights that were the most obvious. So I added in the lightest highlights and then started working backwards towards sort of the middle values. And at the same time, I was building in a little uh, more pencil work, um, you know, just sort of overall. I've only gave myself the same amount of time to work in that I'm giving you. So a lot of these areas aren't as developed as they would be if, as if I were doing a larger uh, drawing of some sort. But I will say that if you look at this particular uh, photo and, and you squint a little bit, you'll see that there is a lot of mid-tone. On the plane, there really aren't that many areas that you would call highlights. And even on the light colored shavings, the same is true. So avoid the temptation to put white pencil marks all over the place. Here's your reference larger and you can still see my little image at the side. So um, as you guys keep working, because we've got one more step to go after this. Okay, as you're working on this particular part and on the, on the last step, I know that it's difficult to hear an artist say, oh, you know, um, I'm, I'm teaching you this technique, but I actually 
want you to veer away from what you see, or it's okay to draw something that isn't what you look at, when your personal goal might be to draw exactly what you're looking at. And you're, and you're wondering, well, well, how do I do that? And I think it's, I, I'm sort of trying to not let you do that. <laughs> and maybe that's, a, maybe that's not a kind thing to do. But what I want you to do is create the illusion of the way a human mind understands an object, rather than worrying about precisely how to accommodate a particular texture or a, you know, a, a particular, uh, say, wood ver one type of wood versus another type of wood in this particular instance. Everything except for the little washer that we're looking at and the, and the blade of the plane, everything is a different type of wood. To me, spending over, overly, uh, you know, getting overly detailed on how to render different types of wood gets us away from the, the overall story, the overall picture and composition. As you become more adept at drawing and more adept at being able to control your pencils, you will be able to, and you'll see in the final uh, step, I've added a bit more of that texture back in, but not with the sense of saying, hey, I want to make this look exactly photorealistically like this particular wood grain, but more to give the sense of, hey, here's enough information that implies that this is likely made out of wood and that these shavings are also likely made out of wood. Because it's easier, it's easier to add more detail in, more texture in, than it is to create a good composition. And I see so many artists heading to that photographic, realistic look, which is really amazing, but does not allow for much artistic expression. And I feel that the artistic expression of creating convincing form has to come before adding the texture onto the top. The texture does not create the form. And this is, I think, a, a big uh, misconception in the, uh, in the minds of a lot of, of beginning and even intermediate, and in some cases, advanced um, uh, art students. The, the texture is sort of like a little icing that you add on the top. Um, all the texture is, is just small or large areas of shading in a particular direction, closely and carefully observed. It, there isn't really a trick to it. Um, what is more important is creating convincing form that looks as if light is coming in one direction, that the form sort of turns because you've carefully observed where that line for the shadow is. For example, when we look at that handle for this plane, we see on the left, now that we're looking at this, it's probably even more obvious to you. On the far left, there's a little bit of a rim light, a reflected light that comes from somewhere. And then just to the right of it, there's the dark shadow that runs down, that shows us that there's a some depth to this thing that you could hold on to it. And where that line, where that dark line runs down, separating the, the shadow from the light, that terminator line, that is far more important. Getting that in the right place is more important than uh, you know showing wood, sort of wood grain. So at this stage, when I'm adding the lights, I'm not worrying particularly about that kind of shading, but I will at the end stage. At the end stage, I'm going to want to make sure that I've addressed things about how form turns. Already, as I'm working through this, I'm starting to notice stuff I didn't notice before. Um, one thing I notice is that where the, the, pl the plane blade is, there's a sort of like that little, um, I don't even know what that form is called, kind of a triangular form that holds up the back. I notice that there's sort of a dark uh, area there. Is that caused by, is that a shadow? Is that part of an indentation? Uh, I don't know, but it's sort of something to notice. I also noticed that the piece of wood holding the blade in place looks like it's got a bit more curve to it than I originally thought. So I sort of added that in as well. So let's move on to the very last um, stage. And at this particular point, now I've gone back and gone, okay, I, I need to address some of those things I've noticed, decide whether they're getting added in or not, and bring this Bring, bring this drawing to a, a completion because it's not even an hour drawing, it's a half hour drawing, but I wanted to, to you know, have some of the punch that I was looking for in terms of darks and lights, um, some lost edges, where the highlights are, a little bit of an indication of, of wood or texture. 
Um, but at this particular point, I'm coming back in and, and you know, paying attention to all of those little details. I'm smoothing out areas that need better pencil shave, uh, shading um, or softening, but I'm using a pencil to do it. I'm using, I'm going back to my H pencils. I'm going back to uh, my, um, um, my, thin my my uh, pointy tip rather than bevel tip uh, pencils to make that happen so i let me see oh good i did <laughs> i did one that has your reference large again so you can see by looking at a um, at the image small down there that just a little bit of attention to those lights and darks just a little bit of attention to form just a small amount of texture for the to show kind of the wood of the handle um you know dropping those highlights in the right place, dropping the, the wood shaving highlights in the right place, but not overdoing it, even though they're lighter than the plane, I decided not to add too much extra white because it might overpower. It might not uh, actually come off right. Now, part of this is governed by the size I'm working at. I'm working at five inches by seven inches. And as you probably know already, um, your beveled pencils have a certain width to them. The uh, white charcoal pencil has a certain width to it, and it's it's pretty wide. It's not very exact. So if you were working on this, say, at like 12 by 16, you could probably get in there and be a lot more subtle with your white and get a little bit more uh, of that lighter tone in using your white charcoal pencil on those shavings. But at a small scale, you absolutely don't want to overdo it. You want to, you want to keep pretty snappy about it. So just about... Three more minutes to wrap this up. I know this isn't a lot of time <laughs> and I can hear some of you groaning already, but it's uh, th this idea of how to get in, how to get into a drawing like this, what the stages are, what the steps that you would take, I think is really important. And then to take some time during the week to come back, reapproach perhaps this particular um, image, or maybe you have something yourself, either live around the house or some other sort of still life you'd like to set up where you'd like to use tone paper, but also incorporate blending. I would highly recommend it because I just really want you to, to know how to pull blending stumps in, how to use them, but absolutely not rely on them. Some art teachers I hear through rumors won't even let you use them at all <laughs> because they, they are so concerned that artists will get sort of um, uh, hooked on them, <laughs> hooked on the fact that you can kind of blend everything together. But I think now that you've had this experience of, of trying um, different ways, the, the, uh, both the academic method and the, uh, the beveled pencil tip method, you see that there are so many different ways to add texture in and that blending stumps are just not the only thing that you have to rely on. Okay, go ahead and, and get, this wrapped up. I'm looking for my last note. Where did I put it? Oh, yeah. One thing I also I hadn't realized I hadn't mentioned before, but if you're when you're doing erasing and you're starting to work on a drawing like this, where we're working overall in darks and where you're um, you're softening and blending and now you're erasing, you're probably dealing with pencil with with crumbs from your eraser and but you don't want to mess up what you beautifully drew. And so whether it doesn't matter what kind of brush you use, there are drafting brushes that are um, that are good to use. You can use a, a, a soft paint brush. Uh, you can just try to blow the uh, shavings off. People have all kinds of different um, tools. Some people use uh, clean makeup brushes uh, to do that sort of thing. But it is a good idea to have some object to whisk away the uh, the brushings without your hand, without using your hand, because you can really mess up a lovely background or, or whatever it is uh, by, by dragging your hand all the way through it. Likewise, this is a great type of um, exercise to be using some other paper across your drawing while you're working on it. So you just don't pick it up and pick up the graphite and imprint it everywhere. Okay, let's wrap this one up. So here are the stages that we went through, um, starting off with just a rough sketch and a, kind, of a no, kind of a rough sketch slash notan to figure out where we were going. Then the basic lines of the scene, add in the darks. Don't have to be terribly careful because you can come back with an eraser. Do some blending. After you've done the blending, get back in there and uh, restate the darks. Make sure that you still have some interest going on, that you didn't just smooth everything out to the point of it just being blah. 
then come in with your highlights, the high, the, the brightest lights, see what you're, how much do you need? You know, don't go, don't go crazy. Don't put pencil marks everywhere, either in the dark or the light. And then for the final stage, this is sort of, this is bringing it to the finish. The darkest darks, the lightest lights, uh, a little bit of texture if you need it, um, just to round the whole thing up. Okay, so <laughs> to finish off for today, as you know, concept, tell your own story. I keep saying it, but I, I just think this is so important. You have years of experience and subject matter and ideas to pull from. So it just takes a little bit, you know, go for a walk, think about something that has to do with your own home, your own life uh, as a subject matter to dry drawing and tone paper using some blending. Edit that photo reference as you need. Take time to observe and figure out what really does need to go into the drawing. Do the rough sketch, it's so important. The no tan is key, even if you do kind of a, uh, you know, uh, half baked, <laughs> I think is a good word for it, half baked no tan, like I did for the for my sketch, where I just made sure I did understand what those dark patterns were. So important. And then the technique, of course, for tone paper, squint to remove that um, concept of color. Just look at the darks and lights, get some of those darks in first, sparing on the blending not a substitute for pencil control. <laughs> Move to the lights, try to not start coloring everything in, come back and refine both the lights and the darks, and then vary the pencil strokes as much as you, as you possibly can. Thinking about what you're drawing while you're drawing, that texture is not the way to create form, but careful observation of the lights and the darks and the shadows definitely is. Okay, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing, but I've got one more thing to say before everyone jumps off. Okay. <laughs> so I know that this is getting, you know, we're sort of getting in there and I'm pounding those particular points uh, into your into your minds. I'm going to continue to do this during the course of the summer because I want you to hear my voice in your head while you're drawing in the future. It will sort of steer you away from some of what I see as of kind of beginner pitfalls that people tend to fall into. But I did want to mention a pencil exercise for this week that's really easy to do. So, and that is if you want to practice doing something like those curled shavings, if you take a piece of paper and just like we used to, to you know, to make decorations and that sort of thing, uh, using what I did was I just cut a piece of, of paper. I used my scissors uh, to, and went like that <laughs> and made my paper curl. Now, if you set this up on, a, on a, um, a bench or a counter or something like that and shine a light in one direction, it will emulate what those um, wood shavings looked like. And it is surprisingly difficult to draw this sort of form properly because you have to make sure that every edge continues in a logical manner, even when you can't see it, even when it sort of goes behind the other piece. It is a really good exercise overall uh, to practice your shading, to practice continuity of line, uh, making things that look logical without having to have an outline do everything using your shading instead. So if you have bags of time, which I'm sure everybody does. <laughs> um, exactly, I see Diane. <laughs> Right, we're all going crazy at this point of the summer, but just file that away for some moment when you do have some time. Thank you, everyone, so much. Your time is so valuable, and I really appreciate you being here for another summer of drawing. I hope that that was useful. We'll be back to using white paper again uh, next week. I cannot remember the subject. Off the top of my... Oh, uh, the pup enjoyed it too, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember exactly the subject matter that we'll be using, but I will send that around in the notes for the PDF afterwards. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful rest of the week, and I look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>